only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephanie Romano, and I'm the Education Coordinator with the Vase Hospital Program. Thank you once again for joining us for another webinar presentation. Uh, this one today we'll be talking about tourniquet use. Uh, we have uh, quite the panel today, so please uh, send your questions in. We've got uh, Jake Pace, who's a PGY4 in emergency medicine. We've got Matt Davis, um, medical director here at SWARP. Uh, Mike Lewell, also regional medical director. We've got Drew Schaefer, who is our EMS fellow, and Pete Morisudu, sorry, Pete, Pete Morisudi, uh, our pre-hospital care specialist. So if you're new to webinars, you'll see a PowerPoint presentation and you'll hear our panel talking about the webinar in the background. Uh, you do also have the opportunity to type any questions or comments to us. So you'll see at the bottom of your control panel uh, a section called the chat box or a question box. You can send any questions or comments throughout the presentation to us. Uh, if you ask a question that we feel the entire audience would benefit from, then we will answer that question live. Otherwise, we can have some dialogue back and forth by typing. Um, if you have any questions, absolutely, again, send them throughout the presentation, or we'll leave a little space at the end of the presentation, too. Uh, otherwise, I think that's it. We will get to it. I will hand it over to the panel. Thanks, Steph. It's Matt Davis here. I just wanted to uh, give the audience a bit of background information about Jake here, who's presenting. Uh, Jake's one of the fourth-year uh, emergency medicine residents, and uh, during his fourth fourth year, Jake has been doing uh, kind of a trauma subspecialty this year, so working a lot with the, the trauma team here in London. Uh, so uh, when Jake did his uh, EMS rotation a few months back, he is going to decide to bring his expertise regarding some of his trauma experiences, and he's going to discuss today the use of tourniquet use, both uh, in the pre-hospital setting, a little bit about the hospital setting as well, and uh, more so providing some of the, the research and evidence behind um, tourniquet use in the pre-hospital setting. So without further ado, thank you, Jake. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so my name's Jake. I'm one of the fourth-year emergency medicine residents, and I just wanted to thank Dr. Davis and Llewell and the Base Hospital for my, providing me with the opportunity to present on this topic today. Sorry, my slides are just jumping ahead, so I'm going to go back a couple slides and just talk about our objectives today. Uh, so first I wanted to review the epidemiology of exsanguinating extremity injuries and also help everyone understand the historical background behind tourniquet use. Uh, then I wanted to explore a little bit the potential complications of tourniquet application and review relevant medical literature, finally sum, uh, summarizing with a review of the BLS standards in Ontario regarding, regarding tourniquet use. Uh, and uh, of course if you have any questions throughout the presentation please uh, send them in and we'll address them as they uh, so, hemorrhage is the leading cause of preventable death in traumatically injured patients. The first, second, third, and fourth cause of death in trauma, traumatically injured patients is hemorrhage. Um, and exsanguinating limb injuries are actually very commonly described in combat settings due to IED use um, and the penetrating mechanism of injury that's commonly experienced by our soldiers. Death from exsanguinating hemorrhage in civilian settings is somewhat rare, and this was exemplified in a study that came out of Houston, Texas. They reviewed over 75,000 ED visits and found only 14 patients with life-threatening sanguinating limb injuries. 50% of these were due to gunshot wounds. So in Canada, we see a lot more blunt trauma um, compared to penetrating. So our rates of exsanguinating limb injuries are going to be exceedingly rare. Um, however, um, recent terrorist attacks have unfortunately increased civilian exposure to these injuries, and this was exemplified uh, through the Boston bombings. I think exsanguinating limb injuries are really exciting because they provide an opportunity to intervene and potentially save a life in the pre-hospital setting. Traumatically injured patients are often bleeding from visceral injuries, their spleen, their liver, intrathoracic injuries, and it's very difficult to provide any intervention that's going to make a meaningful impact um, outside of an operating room or in an interventional radiology suite. However, these sanguinating limb injuries um, provide us with an opportunity to do something both in the emergency department and in the pre-hospital setting that can have a huge impact on the patient's morbidity and mortality, and I thought that was a good reason to review uh, tourniquet use today. Just to give you guys a little bit of historical background on the use of tourniquets, these are not new devices. They've been, there's been documented uses since the times of Alexander the Great. There are Hindu healers who would describe using tourniquets for envenomations uh, 
with rattlesnakes and uh, other sources. Today we're going to talk about tourniquet use for exsanguinating limb injuries. However, there have been described uh, uses in other settings. In 1586, a surgeon by the last name of Duchelac utilized tourniquets for the first time to reduce uh, blood loss during amputations. And in 1674, a French surgeon named Etienne Morel described tourniquet use in the battlefield to treat wounds. The design of tourniquets have undergone a huge degree of changes throughout the history of their use. Um, they are prone to slippage and ineffective arterial compression in the past, and we've made huge gains in their design. Um, however, it's just important to realize that these are not new novel, novel devices and they've been around for a long period of time. Throughout the 20th and 21st century, the opinions of tourniquets were largely based on anecdotal experiences of military surgeons and a lot of that is still true uh, today. A lot of our experience comes from the military setting. However, during World War I and World War II, there was a lot of negative experiences with tourniquet use, and they, pe their use was discouraged by surgeons within the military, and that's evident by the quotes that are up on the screen. Major Blackwood said tourniquets are the mention of the evil one, and in a British War Manual published in 1918, they essentially said if you, you were employing a tourniquet, you were quite ignorant in the treatment of uh, injured patients. And a lot of that was just anecdotal, there was no real evidence, they weren't doing research back in that time, so we were just kind of looking at patients and the general consensus was those with tourniquets tended to fare worse than those without in these settings, is that? It's absolutely true and, and a couple of the reasons why, and it may have actually been fairly true in that tourniquet use in these settings led to harm and that's sort of a consequence of the time themselves. These were young soldiers who were seeing people die around them. They were very afraid of any sort of penetrating trauma. So when they were injured, they were often quick to apply a tourniquet and they were often used for, um, they were inappropriately used for wounds that were uh, like threatening. There's also long pre-hospital transportation time. So these soldiers were applying tourniquets inadequately and leaving them on for a long period of time, which led to a considerable amount of morbidity and limb loss in these wars, and they were often concealed under garments because soldiers weren't instructed properly in how to use them, and the importance of identifying that they had a tourniquet on. So again, there was not a lot of research or literature supporting the negative press that tourniquets got during the First and Second World Wars. However, uh, the circumstances probably led to a lot of, a lot of morbidity in the soldiers uh, from inappropriate use. However, we continue to use tourniquets without a lot of evidence. And in 1980, the Israeli Defense Force began to routinely equip all combat soldiers and medics with tourniquets. The study in the bottom right is a review of 91 patients who were treated with tourniquets. And the authors found that there were a high success rate in hemorrhage control with low incidence of neurologic consequences. The numbers are low and the methodology is not the strongest in that it's retrospective. However, this study did support the use of tourniquets and showed that soldiers could be effective in their application and there were low incidences of, of consequences from their use. So just looking at the study of Jake, was this one of the, the initial studies kind of in the field of evidence-based medicine? You said it was early 80s that this occurred. Was there so much what, before that? Yeah, in my review of the literature, this was the sort of the first major um, study that was published looking at incidences of successful hemorrhage control, but also the incidence of neurologic complications. So yeah, I would say this is one of the sentinel papers in the use of tourniquets um, in a combat setting. Uh, tourniquets are often used in hospital settings for elective procedures where we want to uh, minimize blood loss, but this is sort of the first traumatic uh, uh, tourniquet use study that I found. Um, the next major study that came out really was the 1990s in the U.S. conflict in Somalia, uh, which redemonstrated that extremity injuries were a continued source of morbidity and mortality. Um, they studied injuries over a one-year period of time. This is a short conflict, but they did find 125 casualties, and several percent of these casualties were due to fatal penetrating extremity injuries. So again, in the military setting, there's an ongoing source of mortality and morbidity from penetrating and exsanguinating limb injuries. Uh, 
However, this conflict was so short that there's a limited amount of scientific data that was accumulated from these experiences. But anecdotally, the U.S. military found that tourniquets were useful in the treatment of these patients. So I'll, uh, I'll jump in on here, Jake. So we've got our poll questions. I forgot to introduce them at the beginning, so my apologies for that. Uh, we do have four poll questions throughout the webinar, and your first one is loaded in there now. So go ahead, take a couple seconds, uh, have a read through. So we're asking, early clinical experiences with tourniquet use were largely uh, positive or negative, and then based on either anecdotal experiences or rigorous scientific studies. We'll close that up, and it looks like 85% uh, of the audience is the answer that it's negative based on anecdotal experiences. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, so that is, that is correct in that, um, like I said, in the early wartime experiences of tourniquets, um, there was largely negative experiences with their use, but that was based on anecdotal experiences and very limited scientific rigor. So, um, we take those experiences with a grain of salt, um, as there's been quite a few uh, changes in, in modern pre-hospital care and modern um, trauma care. And a lot learned from those kind of anecdotal experiences, all those negative consequences of, of tourniquet use. So kind of taking from that and and learning from that and using them properly, that has led to these other scientific studies which do show some benefit with them. Exactly. And we're, we're going to go through some more modern evidence in a couple of slides, but first I wanted just to review some of the physiologic impacts of tourniquet use. And largely physiologic impacts of tourniquets can be divided into two major categories, systemic and local. The systemic impact of tourniquets, the benefits are that it centralizes blood volume and it uh, stops active blood loss. And this is exactly what we want to do in our traumatically injured patients who are bleeding to death. It, this is important in a in-hospital elective surgical uh, scenario because centralization of blood volume in an elderly patient who has severe congestive heart failure and cannot tolerate that uh, volume load in their heart could potentially have a negative consequence. But these two benefits from tourniquet use are exactly the reason that we're deploying them in, in the exsanguinating injury, limb injury patient. Complications from a sy systemic point of view from tourniquet use are largely related to when the tourniquet is actually removed and not so much when the tourniquet is applied. Um, and the, this is essentially the reperfusion injury that many of you may be familiar with in terms of crush injuries. So as you remove a tourniquet, there will be an, an efflux of potassium-rich blood, also high in the concentration of carbon dioxide, um, that, that's cold and acidotic. So all of these things can be tremendously, um, uh, tremendously have a tremendous negative impact in someone who's another injury such as a traumatic brain injury. The last thing we want that patient to do is have uh, efflux of, car of uh, blood that has high carbon dioxide levels and potassium can also cause cardiac issues such as dysrhythmias. From a local impact of tourniquets, it's really nerves and muscles that are going to have negative uh, consequences from their application. So nerve injuries are well described in, with tourniquet use, and they range from paresthesias to complete paralysis of the limb. And the incidence has been described between 0.1 and 7.7% depending on the study that you look at. Nerve injuries result from a combination of both local nerve compression at the site of tourniquet application, but also from distal ischemia as we reduce blood flow to the nerves beyond the site of the tourniquet use. The direct compression appears to play a more significant role than, than the ischemia to the nerves, um, and the tourniquet edges are actually the areas that represent maximal shear stress on the nerves and lead to nerve damage. From a muscle perspective, muscle injury results from both local compression and distal ischemia and reperfusion to the muscle. So complications can include muscle breakdown or abdomyolysis, which can have a negative consequence for your kidneys. But you can also develop things like compartment syndrome in extremities that are beyond the site of the tourniquet application. 
The degree of the muscle injury is largely related to the length of the tourniquet application and the pressure that's utilized to occlude, um, that's applied to the limb. And acceptable tourniquet times have been derived from elective surgical procedures and they're estimated to be around two hours. There's an important consideration in safe tourniquet time. So the, the two hour limit comes from elective surgical procedures and patients undergoing total knee uh, replacements. But there is a huge difference in a patient who's undergoing an elective knee replacement from a multiply injured patient. And there have been animal models that demonstrate worsen functional outcomes when extremity ischemia from tourniquet application is combined in the setting of hypotension. So we're not exactly sure what the, the safe application time of a tourniquet is in a hypotensive patient and there is a huge importance on early definitive hemorrhage control which would take place in an operating room. However, if there's going to be a long pre-hospital time or prolonged tourniquet use is unavoidable, we have to recognize that the overall well-being of the patient and the patient's survival takes precedence of the limb that's being threatened by the tourniquet application. Um, it's kind of the price of doing business in someone who's bleeding to death from their limb who may have very long pre-hospital time or intra-facility transport time. We may have to accept that complication realizing that it's saving the patient's life. And so just going back and looking at all the physiology there, so back when they were describing tourniquets as the, the work of the evil one, there is some, some reason as to why they were seeing all these, these complications. So it's not just to say that, yes, they can be applied to any type of wound, um, there are there are definitely complications with arterial tourniquet uses. Exactly, and inappropriate use of a tourniquet for a prolonged period of time may take someone who has a superficial laceration to their leg, which would have been inconsequential in the long term, to now um, leading that patient to needing a fasciotomy for compartment syndrome of potential amputation of their limb or having some neurologic consequence that deems the limb sort of non-usable in the long term. So they, they are not without consequence and we do have to be careful in their application, but in a patient who is actively bleeding to death from a wound, a extremity injury, um, there are some benefits uh, that we can that we can derive from their use. So. Absolutely, and that's why you, when you look, I think you touched on later in the presentation, all the guidelines say when direct pressure itself fails, then move to the tourniquet use because there are, there are risks involved with it. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're going to talk about sort of the, the stepwise sequential um, guidelines for, ex, for hemorrhage control in an extremity. And, and uh, Dr. Davis is um, extremely correct in that our first line therapy is always going to be direct pressure to stop blood flow. So just to summarize, um, tourniquet impact, um, they're potentially useful for cessation of ongoing hemorrhage but they're potentially bad for the limb at stake. And the ideal application is likely less than two hours, um, the two hour mark suggested through healthy volunteer studies. Um, this is our second review question. And so the second question is launched. So we're asking the physiological consequences of the tourniquet application are. If anyone out there does have a question, feel free to type it in and I will uh, I'll address it in the background as well. Okay, so we're going to close out the poll, share those results. And it looks like we've got 58% of you uh, as the majority. So you've got a decrease in pH, increased potassium, and increased B2. Okay, perfect. I don't know if um, we need to elaborate on it any further, but it's essentially the reperfusion injury um, that as, um, as a limb has decreased oxygen flow, you're going to have the limb become acidotic and the pH is going to drop. You're going to have an increase in the potassium as muscle cells start to die and there's going to be an increase in carbon dioxide as um, more, more of that's produced and less of it is removed from that, that limb. I want to talk about the modern um, evidence for tourniquet use and one of the fundamental uh, concepts that we're taught in medical school as physicians is first do no harm. So 
uh, we've seen evidence that tourniquets are potentially harmful, um, but we're also talking about their use in a civilian setting where the incidence of exsanguinating limb injuries is low. So are we going to be creating, causing more harm by using uh, tourniquets in a setting where the actual disease that we're using them for rarely occurs? The, however, the first um, set of uh, studies we're going to look at does not come from the civilian setting, but again, the military setting in Baghdad, uh, in, in Iraq. So these are two studies uh, that were published by the same group, uh, the main author is Cray, um, that looked at tourniquet use at a U.S. combat support hospital over a seven-month period of time. The first study looked at um, survival as a primary outcome and they found a marginal survival benefit to patients who had tourniquets applied in the pre-hospital setting. The second study looked at uh, success rates of tourniquet application and they just defined a successful tourniquet as one that seizes blood flow, um, which was described as an absence of a distal pulse. Um, the authors found that there were high rates of tourniquet effectiveness and also found low rates of inappropriate use in that same Baghdad population. They did find that prolonged tourniquet use, which was defined as greater than two hours, was associated with higher rates of amputations and fasciotomies, but were not associated with higher rates of pain, um, nerve palsies, renal failure, or extremity thrombosis. There was a debate in the study um, as to whether the increased rate of fasciotomies was actually related to tourniquet application. Um, as all fasciotomies done in this setting were done prophylactically to prevent any further injury occur from occurring in the leg. So we're not sure if these people just had such significant injuries that the surgeons felt at the time that they should do fasciotomies and relieve the compartments from that increased pressure that they're expecting to occur or whether they were actually necessary and related to the turkey use. Now, I think that's a good segue. We actually have a question from the audience here. And the question is, itself is, what are the complications of fasciotomies? Given that, you know, you're less likely to require fasciotomy the, the less time that tourniquet is on, but there are, as you've mentioned before, times when the, the tourniquet may be on for prolonged periods of times, and that increases your rate of requiring a fasciotomy. And so they're just questioning what are the, the risks associated with fasciotomies. But I also think there's other things to consider, too, with that prolonged period of time. It's just not the fasciotomy itself, but other things that you've touched on in your presentation that could be the complications as well. Sure, so fasciotomies are a huge concern and there are some complications. When, whenever a fasciotomy occurs, patients require prolonged therapies and more ORs. So they often require a skin graft and having an open fasciotomy increases that patient's risk to needing more blood products in the hospitals. They tend to ooze while they're waiting for their fasciotomies to be closed. They're at increased risk of infection. There are aesthetic complications as there are scars from fasciotomies, and there can be limb dysfunction as your your muscles can become um, injured or or um, you may actually have muscle death from a fasciotomy site. Now, uh, fasciotomies are a big complication, but there are also, you know, the systemic complications that we talked about in terms of uh, renal failure from rhabdomyolysis, cardiac dysrhythmias from, uh, from your potassium load, and in patients with traumatic brain injury, their outcomes uh, can be worsened significantly um, through high rates of carbon dioxide, or high levels of carbon dioxide and the cerebral vasodilation that will occur from it. So all the complications with certain key application are real and they're significant, um, and I think there's something we have to be conscious of moving forward. I think that the key you're trying to describe here um, eloquently is the fact that um, tourniquet use is definitely life-saving in the military military application and also in the devastating limb wound. But in the civilian population that may not have the true devastating life-threatening limb wound, putting an application of a tourniquet um, is not necessarily required and does carry morbidity and mortality if the bleeding can be controlled by direct pressure alone. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's important, you know, that we have this tool in our arsenal, but that we're using it appropriately in, in the right patients. Um, so that is, those are military studies. Now, we do have some actual homegrown evidence uh, from Canada, and this is a study uh, from both Sunnybrook in Toronto and Foothills in Calgary. Um, and this was published in 2013. It was a retrospective review of Canadian patients with isolated extremity trauma and associated arterial injuries. 
The authors looked at both Sunnybrook and Foothills Hospital from 2001 to 2010, so over a nine-year period. And they looked at all adult patients at the two level one trauma centers who had arterial injuries from extremity trauma. The intervention itself was the use of a pre-hospital tourniquet, and the main outcome was in-hospital mortality, but they also looked at length of stay, rates of compartment syndrome, amputations, and blood product transfusions. Over a nine-year period, they only had 190 patients, so a low, a low rate of, of arterial injuries from extremity trauma, but they also only had four pre-hospital tourniquets used over that nine period of time. All four of these pre-hospital tourniquets were improvised by police or, or bystanders, and the items used that they described in this are, are sort of the pictures that are on the, uh, the slide, and that a necktie, a belt, and a handkerchief were the three, three different um, items used to provide tourniquets, so they can be improvised. Uh, there's also four other patients who had tourniquets applied in the trauma bay within one hour of the injury. Unfortunately, within this study period, six patients died without tourniquet use from extremity injuries and all bled to death. And of the eight patients who had tourniquets applied, uh, there were no deaths. There was an extremely low rate of um, utilization that only 4% of patients had tourniquets applied. Um, so my main takeaways from the study are that the actual incidence of arterial injuries are low. The rates of tourniquet application in the pre-hospital setting are even lower with only 4% of patients. All tourniquets were actually improvised and six people in the study died from exsanguinating injuries without a tourniquet applied. So those are six potential um, saves and, and wasn't well described their other in, uh, their injuries and how that contributed to their death but six people were felt to die from an exsanguinating limb injury without a tourniquet being applied, uh, which is something that I think we can improve upon. The next study I wanted to look at came from Boston Civilians EMS Experience, and it was also a retrospective review between 2005 and 2012. Um, these authors found that nine, there were 98 cases of pre-hospital tourniquet application, and their breakdown of injuries uh, were a bit different than what we're going to experience in Canada in that there were 67% of, of injuries were penetrating and only 7% were blunt. Um, the breakdown between upper and lower extremities were 54% were from the upper extremity and 45% were from the lower. And the average pre-hospital tourniquet time was extremely short at 14 minutes. The authors found that over half of the tourniquets that were applied in the field were removed immediately upon their arrival to the emergency department, and only 14 cases had a documented vascular injury requiring repair. There were two cases of complications potentially attributable to tourniquet use, giving an overall complication rate of about 2%. The one tourniquet use was a case of forearm numbness, and the second was a potential vascular complication, and it's a bit unclear whether this complication was related to the actual injury, which was a gunshot wound, or whether it was related to the, the tourniquet use itself. My takeaways from this study are that there was a high rate of inappropriate applica application of tourniquets. Over 50 of them were removed immediately upon arrival to the emergency department, and only 14 cases had documented vascular injuries. On the on the positive side of things, there are very low rates of potential complications. Um, so I think it's in, important to realize that um, you may be, that the, that the providers in the study may have been over applying tourniquets, however it doesn't appear that they cause a tremendous amount of harm and that's probably related to the extremely short pre-hospital time that was experienced in this, um, in this study with 14 minutes. And did they make mention of uh, you know, any methods prior to the tourniquet application or did most of the cases go directly to tourniquet application? Was there an attempt to stop the bleeding manually? So that, that was not well described in the study. Um, I'd have to go back and look at the methodology itself, but I do not believe the authors described their um, sequential treatment of extremity hemorrhage. So that would be something to review uh, in the future in the study, but I do not believe they, they described that well. I believe the last study that I have to review, and you guys are probably getting bored of hearing about studies, but it came from LA County, and this is probably the largest civilian study to date. Uh, there were 87 patients who had tourniquets applied over a seven-year period. 
and the average turnkey application time was 103 minutes. So significantly different than the 14 minutes experienced in Boston. That may be related to pre-hospital transport times. 15 patients underwent amputations, 14 of which were performed due to the primary injury. So not related to the turnkey application. The injury was uh, sufficiently uh, bad that the surgeons felt that uh, amputation was required. And unfortunately, a single patient had a very prolonged turnkey application, approximately eight hours, which was related to a prolonged interfacility transport. It's important to know that that patient itself, the authors of the study, felt that the turnkey actually saved that patient's life. So there was a complication from that turnkey application. Uh, however, they felt that the patient would have died if that turnkey was not applied. Seven other patients, uh, approximately 8% suffered complications, including compartment syndrome, acute renal failure, bleeding, coagulopathy, hepatic failure, ARDS, which is a bad lung disorder, shock and wound infections. However, the contribution of tourniquets to these complications is a bit uncertain because these patients had such severe injuries that a lot of these complications may occur with or without tourniquet application. The authors in, in LA felt that given the low rates of complications and the potential life-saving benefit from the aggressive use, supports the aggressive use of tourniquets in the pre-hospital setting in patients who have sanguinating limb injuries. So again, just looking at, you know, going over all these studies here, Jake, a lot of research in the military experience, but less so in the civilian experience. And just because something is good in one population doesn't always mean it's good in another population. So I think it's important, although you, you've hit a lot of studies here, it's important for everyone to see kind of the progression of how, how evidence comes about. And just because something works well or theoretically doesn't always necessarily mean that it's going to pan out in a different environment. So this clearly shows that, yes, let, uh, tourniquets can be life-saving, but there's also complications associated with them. So there are cases where tourniquets should be used and cases where it probably shouldn't be because that risk outweighs any benefit. So great job on, on reviewing that, that literature just to give our paramedics the, the background as to where we, where we come from and where we're going to. We're going to move on, and, and I just want to go over some recommendations from major tra trauma services, uh, both in the United States and around the world. So the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma publishes a lot of guidelines surrounding recommendations for the treatment of traumatically injured patients. And this working group recommends the use of turnkeys in the pre-hospital setting for the control of significant extremity injury if direct pressure is ineffective or impractical, and I think that's important to recognize that your first-line therapy for all these patients is going to be direct pressure. EAST is um, another major guideline, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma, and they dictate a lot of the practice pattern of a lot of trauma providers in, in North America, and their stance on the use of uh, tourniquet use is that in cases of hemorrhage from penetrating lower extremity and, and it is upper extremity as well in which manual compression is unsuccessful, tourniquets may be used as a temporary adjunct until definitive repair. And that's important to recognize as well that these are not definitive therapies for these injuries. These patients do require an intervention when they arrive at the hospital and that intervention needs to happen very urgently. Um, and speaking from the inpatient setting, when we have a patient with an arterial injury, um, those are those are made very high priority cases um, for the surgeons. Uh, I wanted to touch on your practice guidelines, given that um, this that's what we're here for is your education, and and this is the basic life support patient care standards. Um, so s s the current. Um, Guidelines are out that state with uh, respect to injury sites, uh, hemorrh if hemorrhage control cannot be uh, done using usual methods, um, that you are to apply and inflate a BP cuff until bleeding stops, um, which is exactly what we do in the emergency department actually. At, at London Health Science Center, we do not have formalized tourniquet devices. We can call the operating room for a pneumatic tourniquet, but that does take some time. So if someone were to come in with a life-threatening bleed from an extremity, um, my go-to would be to inflate a manual blood pressure cuff until blood, until um, we seize blood flow and there's no further distal pulses and, and keep that inflated until we can get a formal device. Um, so, and we, the other thing to note is that blood pressure cuffs tend to leak. So we often clamp 
both the tubes with a Kelly clamp or, or some sort of clamp to prevent that ongoing leak because you will find that your pressure slowly, slowly um, degrades. Um, Dr. Davis is providing me with a little sneak peek for the, the basic life support standards coming out in December of 2017. Um, and in terms of soft tissue injury standards, um, in terms of wound hemorrhage control, the priority is still direct pressure to the bleeding sites. And that is your go-to with digital pressure, hands leaning on the wound with whatever, with the, with whatever force you're able to generate. And if that is not uh, adequate, then you apply additional dressings to try to stop the bleeding. And if that's still not adequate, then you are to apply an arterial tourniquet to the limb about five centimeters above the injury until bleeding stops. The last resort is actually hemostatic dressings, which is an interesting topic on its own. Um, but we will we'll keep moving on, and if there are questions about hemostatic dressings, like, we can address those. And so just a, a question came from the audience just about what options are, are available right now, and I think you've covered that with the, the BLS standards using the, the manual cuff as a, as a tourniquet when manual pressure itself does not, does not work. Um, and then just going over these, these guidelines here, as, as most of you are aware, these do not come into force until uh, December of 2017. And uh, at that, that time, you know, services will be deciding which type of arterial tourniquet they wish to, to carry on the rigs. Um, again, looking at, at different brands options out there. Uh, so again, at this time, we can't really comment on, on which ones that, that your services will carry, uh, but that will be coming, coming down the road. And just speaking to the equipment standard, or sorry, this is the uh, use of a tourniquet. Um, the guidelines surrounding tourniquet use, which I think are very appropriate, is that if a tourniquet is applied to stop uncontrollable, uncontrollable extremity hemorrhage, it should not be removed in the pre-hospital setting, which I think is very important. If you're going to place a tourniquet for a life-threatening bleed, that tourniquet should stay up until you get to the trauma center. Um, also, the time of tourniquet application must be documented, and that should be communicated to the receiving facility. Um, and in settings of a mass ca multi-casualty incident, the time of tourniquet application must be listed on the patient and tourniquet, and never, never ever cover tourniquet once it's in place. So that's a, if you apply a tourniquet in the pre-hospital setting as a member of the trauma team, that's one of the first things we want to hear that that tourniquet is up, so we are aware and can and can make appropriate uh, and appropriately prioritize that in our patient assessment. So another question just come in here, Jake. Just a question, is there anything um, that can be done to slow the flow versus totally occlude it close to hospital? I think you kind of touched on, on you mean the purpose of an arterial tourniquet is to completely occlude flow, mm -hmm. uh, whereas direct pressure you know, may be able to definitely stop the bleeding, but may also just slow it down enough that it's not exsanguinating. So. Exactly. I think your it's uh, pin, it's pressure over the wound site, um, which is going to try to, it, that will not stop flow or it will very rarely stop flow in an active arterial bleed. However, it may tempor temporarily slow the blow, uh, blood flow um, to allow you to get to hospital. Okay. Um, and this is just the equipment standards. Again, um, not coming into effect until December of 2017. Um, and these are just the minimum requirements for an arterial tourniquet, uh, constructed in a lightweight, durable material, be single-use and disposable, and provide circumferential pressure to any extremity with complete occlusion of arterial blood flow, which will also allow for incremental increases in tension as, as that's important. And so uh, another question's come in here. When you're talking about direct pressure, you're referring to pressure directly over the wound or to proximal pulse points, or are you referring to, to both? It's an excellent question. In fact, um, it's strange. If you look back to the 2010 American Heart Association guidelines, none of us actually make recommendations for resuscitation outside of just cardiovascular care. So in their first aid section, they actually talked about uh, that specific point about pulse points. They suggested that pulse points should be abandoned as a, as a concept for hemostatic control. So when we talk about direct pressure, we're talking about directly over the wound. And um, not every wound is the same. Um, we've also had, uh, as all of us have seen before, uh, as receiving emergency positions, patients coming in with large amounts of gauze bandaged over a bleeder, uh, even with a, ten a tension on that, on that bleed. And effectively what happens is you have these saturated, saturated gauze pads that effectively aren't 
uh, stopping the bleeding whatsoever. They're just masking the external hemorrhage. And when you take that off, you see a small little peripheral bleeder that, that's, that's bleeding. And so we're talking about direct pressure. It's hard, hard direct pressure. Um, I always use the ana analogy of um, the garden hose. If you put a garden hose and you wrap a huge amount of towels at the end of it with tape, no matter how tight you, take, you put that tape on, that garden hose is still going to leak. But if you, put the, if you take that garden hose and just kink it, it stops, it stops um, leaking all, all of a sudden. So direct pressure as much as you possibly can bear to it on the wound is, is key. Um, clearly with the devastating wounds we're talking about here for tourniquet application, that direct pressure is going to fail if you have both bones and a huge sort of devastating uh, limb injury. That's where you consider tourniquets. That is a great question and, and thanks for posing that, whoever sent that in. Uh, this is our next review question, so we'll let Steph start the poll. Okay, so that poll question is now live. So we're looking for a true statement here. And for those of you watching, do keep uh, keep the questions coming. We'll close the poll. Results are shown 77% saying that hemorrhage is the leading cause of death in trauma patients. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so as I said at the very beginning, hemorrhage is the, the, the first, second, and third most common cause of death in traumatically injured patients. Um, also, exsanguinating limb injuries are very rare in the civilian setting. Um, but I do think there is a tremendous amount of information we can learn from combat medicine. It's not directly applicable and we do have to take the differences in our incidence of disease and our treatment strategies into consideration when we're talking about supplying combat medical studies to the civilian setting. However, there is lots we can learn from those. And tourniquets, I would say, do pose significant complications. Um, and they can potentially be dangerous and cause morbidity in your patients. However, I think there certainly is a role for their use in the civilian setting. We just had another question come in here, just kind of going back to your description about the, uh, the Boston um, uh, study there, and where there was a, I believe 57% of the tourniquets were removed by emergency physicians upon uh, the patient arrival in the ED. And the question come, coming in uh, from one of our, our paramedic colleagues is, might that high rate of immediate removal in the Boston Emerge also be attributed to a lack of trust in the EMS's personal judgment? And this is a, seems like a bit of a, a front-loaded question. I mean, it's hard to, for us to speak on, on the exact uh, cases, the individual cases themselves. Um, but I, I, I would suggest that um, I think that if people are out there thinking that we don't trust you as the uh, as the paramedics that are transporting patients to the ED, all of us here are ED physicians who um, absolutely trust the paramedic assessment. When you bring patients in, it's actually very carefully uh, contemplated exactly what you've seen, what you what you what you heard, and also the history of hemorrhage on site, uh, as well as any sort of um, patient you bring in, because you guys are the ones that see the patient at their worst. And so, be it cardiac, be it respiratory, be it whatever the presenting complaint. Uh, your history when the patient was uh, seen initially is imperative to our management strategy. So we absolutely would uh, respect what you have to say. I also think an important point to add to that is if you bring someone in with a tourniquet on and the emergency physician or trauma team members remove the tourniquet, uh, that's not necessarily the team saying they didn't believe that it was indicated in the pre-hospital setting. We recognize that you have limited resources and limited hands in that situation. and. If, if the team feels that a tourniquet is indicated, that drastically changes that patient's management over the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So if we remove it and we feel that it can be removed or the bleeding can be controlled with direct pressure in, in the emergency department setting, which is different than what you're experiencing in the pre-hospital pre uh, area, um, that doesn't mean that it wasn't indicated. It just means that it, we, that patient may not need to be exposed to the potential complications that are related to prolonged tourniquet use. So there's often multiple um, treatment priorities for multiply injured patients, and we have to weigh them in terms of what's going to lead to the best outcome for the patient. So and you may have, you have obviously different resources within the emergency department, both a uh, number of bodies available to help and equipment available, lighting being another one where you may be able to see a bleeder and, and, and clamp it off, which again, the pre-hospital setting many challenges as to 
why the tourniquet may come off in the emergency department. I agree 100%. It's not a reflection of, of poor judgment that the emergency doctors or trauma doctors are thinking that something was done, done inappropriately. Very well could be appropriate app use of the, the tourniquet in a pre-hospital setting, but there are sometimes other methods that can be utilized once the patient reaches the, the hospital. Um, in terms of potential tourniquet devices available, um, some of them, there are multiple commercially developed tourniquet devices and some of them are um, depicted on this slide. So in the top left, that is our standard in the emergency department right now. We use a blood pressure cuff and we inflate till we do not have um, a, a pulse and uh, then we clamp with the Kelly. However, in the top right, that's a cat tourniquet. And in the bottom left, it's soft T turnkey, which are currently used um, in Essex and Windsor uh, only, I believe. Um, and and the, the function of those devices are very similar in that uh, there's a band that goes around the extremity, and then that, the bar that you see is the windlass, and you continue to spin that until it tightens sufficiently and, and we get adequate, uh, adequate control of hemorrhage. Uh, the bottom right is uh, Rats tourniquet, and, and I don't believe those are commonly used. Um, however, they, there is another commercial device that's produced. Okay. Um, so in terms of tourniquet tips, um, we're getting ready to rip, get close to the end here. Um, again, only apply tourniquet when brisk bleeding is not controlled with direct pressure. You apply proximal, but as close to the wound as possible. Never cover a tourniquet and make sure that it's communicated that a tourniquet is applied and write down the time that it's applied. It's going to help us prioritize how quickly we need to get that tourniquet down and the patient to a definitive intervention. If you put a tourniquet up, we strongly advise that a tourniquet never comes down until you're in the hospital setting. And you have to be mindful of something called paradoxical bleeding. So paradoxical bleeding um, occurs if a tourniquet is only including the venous blood flow. So venous blood flow is a low pressure state and arterial blood flow is at a much higher pressure. If you're only, if the tourniquet pressure is only including the venous blood flow, you're going to continue to have an arterial inflow into the extremity, which essentially creates a one-way valve and you may actually see an increase in blood and bleeding from the wound site if you're only uh, including the venous flow. When you apply a tourniquet, continue tightening until bleeding from the wound stops and distal pulses are absent. Being mindful of the fact that with vascular injuries, distal pulses may not actually be present to begin with. So that may be part of the, the initial issue. So uh, keep going until you don't have any blood coming from the wound. Uh, this is our final review question. Uh, and we'll post this one. So the fourth and final question is now live. We are asking a uh, contemporary EMS experience suggests that. Um, so it right, so we'll go ahead and close that. Results. It looks like our majority at 46 percent has answered that tourniquets have high rates of inappropriate utilization. Um, so that is true. Um, again, so tourniquets in a, in a contemporary EMS experience, we see that there are low rates of, of complications. They're not routinely used, which we saw in the study from Calgary and Toronto. Um, they are supported by almost every major clinical practice guideline that's um, published and, and for bleeding that's not controlled with direct pressure. However, the Boston experience did show there are high rates of inappropriate utilization. Um, uh, so that is the correct answer. I believe we have a couple more questions coming so, in. Another question just re regarding the LA County study and, and Jake, it, can you just comment on why ARDS may have been a complication to uh, tourniquet application? And ARDS uh, stands for acute respiratory dis Distress syndrome. So, so ARDS is um, a very unfortunately common disease process we see in our intensive care units in uh, multiple injured patients. Reasons that you may see ARDS after tourniquet has been applied is due to the metabolic changes that are occurring in the blood flow in the extremity while there's no blood flow to and from 
from that extremity. So you have a lot of inflammatory markers that are in your blood that are accumulating and as soon as you release that and your lungs are exposed to those inflammatory markers, there may be damage to the lungs which leads to inflammation and the whole ARDS clinical picture that can ensue after. And, and the, the list of causes of ARDS is innumerable and that relates to its uh, multifactorial um, etiology and cause. And another question coming up, uh, when we show up in the emergency department and the, the wounds, so it looks like a, the question is someone's used manual compression using a dressing has been used to stop the bleeding uh, and the uh, allied healthcare provider or nurse or physician resident takes that dressing off, is that counting as tourniquet removal time? So I'm not sure if that's more of a documentation issue if you're still there an ambulance offload and the, the nurse looks at the dressing, is that considered tourniquet removal time? And I'm not sure if that's the, the gist of this, this question. Tourniquet removal time should be when the tourniquet is removed. And so if there's a tourniquet on, in place, that's the key we need to document. But if, if it's just the dressing that comes down, I wouldn't classify that as tourniquet removal time per se. Yeah, and I think what you may see if you come in with a tourniquet up and we say get down, you may see us put that tourniquet right back up very quickly if we see, feel the hemorrhage that's, that's produced from the injury is life-threatening and we don't think it's going to be controllable via pressure. And sometimes we release a tourniquet to see if there is actually a brisk arterial bleed. Sometimes it's obvious given the injury pattern that there's going to be severe vascular injury, but sometimes it's not obvious. It's very hard to determine. And like I said, sometimes we take the tourniquet down to see if we can control it via other means, whether it's clamping of the, the uh, proximal vessel or whether we want to... Um, or whether we're going to put the turnkey back up and take the patient directly to the ER. So, um, yeah, I think that answers that question. And then just a, another question that's come in. When obvious massive arterial exsanguination is present, uh, is the prioritization of ABCs changed to CAB and control of bleeding prioritized over airway and breathing? So I think that um, recognizing that some of the military training that surrounds this um, in the austere environment where you have one medic and it could be um, a significantly different environment than a two paramedic team you have in civilian applications, definitely we recognize that the the, the, CAD, the CAB approach is, is certainly endorsed by the Canadian Forces and some other uh, military training. Uh, um, but I think in our situation in the civilian response, we should still have um, our priorities go to the ABC um, and recognizing that we try and get that, that tourniquet on as soon as possible and hopefully um, we can do it all nearly simultaneously if we have two, potentially even three or four paramedics on scene with these type of bleeds. Um, before we sort of spoke about anecdotal experience in the First World Wars and and how that's not great scientific evidence. However, I wanted to share with, with you guys a couple of anecdotal experiences I've had over the last uh, six months acting as the Trauma Fellow at London Health Science Center. Um, I've personally been involved in four cases where I believe tourniquets saved uh, a patient's life. And one of the uh, cases, I'm going to show so, uh, some fairly graphic images here, um, was of a motorcyclist who had a traumatic amputation of his left thigh. Uh, he has a T-pod binder over his pelvis because his pelvis was severely injured. But you can see there's a blood pressure cuff just underneath that um, T-pod. I was on the phone taking the call from Strathroy and, and the mercy physician at that site was describing the injury pattern and the active arterial bleeding from the leg. We essentially told that physician that if they couldn't get a tourniquet, proximal to that wound, that patient was likely going to die en route to our hospital. And we're very grateful on the patient. Uh, they were able to successfully deploy a blood pressure cuff just above the bleeding site, which worked beautifully at stopping the blood flow, and that patient had a very good outcome. Obviously, he, he progressed to lose his leg, but he, um, he survived this injury, and I think a lot, a lot of that is directly related to this, that physician successfully getting that blood pressure cuff up and stopping the bleeding. And you can imagine trying to find a site in this wound to stop bleeding with direct compression is going to be very difficult. It's a mangled mess and you are not, it's going to be very difficult to find that, that blood loss source. So um, that's one of the more uh, interesting cases of tourniquet application that I've seen. A couple more questions have rolled in here. Uh, this question, is it appropriate to personally purchase a, a cat tourniquet, which is a, a type of brand of tourniquet, and use it before 
December 2017, and that's when the, the BLS guidelines uh, come into force uh, that uh, require uh, as a minimum equipment standard for, for all rigs to carry the uh, arterial tourniquet. Um, if, and the question is, if direct pressure is inadequate um, and cannot be stopped with a blood pressure cuff and, and Kelly clamps. So there's a couple um, key things about this question about um, part of it is um, relating to when a standard comes into force. So with the new uh, BLS patient care standards coming into force, uh, we were very specifically told by the Ministry of Health uh, that we cannot have two standards in place at one time. That being said, um, therefore, in theory, anything that's introduced in the new BLS patient care standards cannot be applied until they come into force. Um, nevertheless, tourniquet use has been described in the current BLS patient care standards, and some paramedic services actually have tourniquets in place. Um, my suggestion to whoever asked this question would be that I think you need to follow what your paramedic service equipment uh, is being provided, because um, you're, you're following the standard of care that is provided at that paramedic service. So rather than purchasing your own equipment and going beyond what that level of care that's provided by that service, I think it's a pretty slippery slope and a bit of a gray area, so I'd recommend um, going with whatever the equipment is provided for you to do your job by your paramedic service is what you utilize. I'm not so sure that the, uh, the, if there's any legal case that would, uh, that would uh, come out of this, given the morbidity, that, the morbidity that's associated with tourniquet use, that your service would stand behind you and support you for using something that they do not provide their paramedics as a system to use. Uh, another question, kind of similar on the same lines to that. Um, and some police forces within the Southwest actually carry tourniquets, and the question becomes if uh, an officer applies a tourniquet before uh, paramedics arrive and paramedic's clinical judgment is deems that the tourniquet is not necessary, uh, what is a paramedic to do? Suggestions for dealing with, with the police in, in, that, in that situation. And um, my take is as the trained uh, medical uh, expert in this in this area over over the police themselves. I think your clinical judgment is definitely uh, what's what we're, we're relying on on our patients in the pre-hospital setting. You've been trained for dealing with hemorrhage control, uh, and come the new BLS standards, you'll be trained with uh, arterial tourniquet use as well. And so, in 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 if your clinical judgment, this wound does not warrant a, a tourniquet, then it's fine to to remove because again, they are associated with some morbidity uh, as well. So if it's, if it's a paper cut and you don't think it needs it, then absolutely you can, can remove it. But if there's something in the history which indicates, you know, an officer's been shot and they're bleeding profusely, there's a lot of blood on scene, then it, was, it probably was indicated for that officer to use the tourniquet and I would leave it on. And most officers use the tourniquet just for themselves. That's what they're issued for is themselves only and not for external mm -hmm. use. Some do go above and beyond as they've been trained uh, to do so, but most of the time it is for personal use or buddy, other officer use. So you won't see that too many times in flight on, on the street. Um, so just to, to wrap things up here, um, some takeaway points from the entire presentation are that exsanguinating limb injuries are rare. Uh, but they do occur and they provide us with an opportunity to have a significant impact on patient morbidity and mortality. Direct pressure, uh, as we've emphasized, remains the first line therapy to arrest bleeding. However, evidence suggests that tourniquet use is associated with lower rates of complications. We want to avoid long tourniquet application times, however, um, life over limb. Um, and if you're going to use it, use it. Tighten it on and, get, and stop the bleeding. Don't um, don't have that thing loosely applied and experience paradoxical bleeding uh, as I previously described. Um, so another another question's come in. And can you clarify the statement about the Boston Marathon study where it states that tourniquets were inappropriately used? Um, so it was deemed in the study 54% were used inappropriately. Um, and the relative rates of the complication was low at 2 to 8%. So the question is, wouldn't it be better to be using tourniquets liberally and have them removed at the hospital due to relatively minimal complications? And they're using minimal as in statistically speaking. However, some of these complications, I would argue, are, are not necessarily minimal complications from inappropriate tourniquet use. Uh, that's, that's a great question. So I think there's a couple of questions buried within it. So the first one is describe um, 
what was meant by inappropriate use. So the authors of the study had two vascular surgeons review every case and determine if they felt the use of a tourniquet was appropriate. Um, in the study, there were 98 cases of tourniquets being identified. However, there were only 14 documented vascular injuries in the operating area. So there certainly is a degree of overuse of the tourniquet. Um, and in terms of the, in, the definition of inappropriate, that was defined by two vascular surgeons who are the specialists in terms of, of extremity vascular injuries. Um, in terms of wouldn't it be safer to over-apply, there's certainly going to be some degree of over-application of tourniquets, um, but we do have to recognize that they are not free of complications. And, and like Dr. Davis said, the complications are real, they're significant, and they will have a real impact on your patient's uh, long-term health and function. So we have to use them in situations where we believe they're truly indicated. And, and those situations are major bleeding that's not controlled after attempts at direct pressure is used. I don't, is there any other questions? I think that's all the, the questions that we've had roll in. So I just want to take the time to, to thank Jake for this very informative session. I think it's probably one of the, the webinars where we've had the most audience questions come in. So thank you for the, the audience for participating. Some great questions here today. And just like to, to thank uh, Mike Bluell and uh, Pete Morissuti for joining us today and giving us a bit of insight into well as to our TL tourniquets. And, uh, and uh, we hope to see you or have you involved in our next webinar. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, giving me the time to present the topic and uh, thank, thank Base Hospital and the entire crew, including uh, Dr. Drew Schapert, for the help that he's provided in preparing this presentation. So thanks, guys.